I'm Dr Louise Newsom. Welcome to this talk in which I'm going to talk about menopause and HRT, unpicking the evidence about both. So before I start, just for transparency, these are my declarations. I don't have any financial de declarations. Myself and my team do not work and do any paid work with any pharmaceutical companies nor endorse any products at all. Um, I'm a director of the Newson Health Menopause and Wellbeing Centre here in Stratford-upon-Avon and also the director of the Newson Health Research and Education um, organisation, which is not for profit, soon to be a charity. I founded the Newson Health Academy. I'm the director of the Free Balance app and also the founder of the Menopause Charity. I'm also a member of our UK Government Menopause Task Force. My one declaration, however, is that I take HRT. When I was perimenopausal, I had all sorts of symptoms really affecting my ability to work and function so I know firsthand how hard it is to be a perimenopausal woman but I also know how hard it is to receive the right treatment because it took me many times of trying to find the right person to prescribe the right dose and type of HRT for me. So Stratford-upon-Avon, as many of you might know, is, is pretty much in the centre of England. It's a beautiful place to work in. It's known for Shakespeare, and I really want it to become the menopause capital of the world. So this is where we work out of, Winton House, which is owned by the council. Rebecca Lewis in the bottom right and myself uh, found the building um, available to rent. It didn't look as beautiful as this five years ago. We decided we wanted to make somewhere that was very calm, that was very safe for women from all over the country to come and enable them to be listened to, to be heard, to receive the right care, advice and treatment that they absolutely deserve. So we're really privileged to be working in such an amazing environment. There are still many barriers to good menopause care. And this is a quote from the all party parliamentary group on the menopause that came out in 2022. And it talks about the taboo, which there still is, but also these words sexism and ageism, really powerful, but very important and relevant words when we think about the menopause. And there are millions of women who are menopausal in the UK and many more globally, of course. So we've opened it to really tackle this unmet need. As I say, it was established in 2018, really in response to the difficulties women in the NHS were facing in obtaining evidence-based treatment. We provide individualised consultations with a very holistic approach to both the perimenopause and menopause. And we also increasingly see women who are suffering with PMS and PMDD. We discuss treatment options, both HRT and non-hormonal treatments, which are relevant to our patients, their symptoms and their future health. Treating the menopause is not just about one treatment, it's often a multitude of treatments that can change with time as well. And our initial goal was to work with four other GPs, but the huge demand really made our, us change our business model. And we now employ more than 100 clinicians and many of our consultations are done remotely. And we see around 4,000 women a month. And most of these women are women who have tried to receive the right help, support and treatment from their own NHS um, clinicians and have been unable to. Many women we see are already on some treatment, some HRT, but it's not the right one dose or type for them. So before I started, I start, I want to talk about a case. Now, this is a lady called Jennifer, 42 year old lady. Her real name wasn't Jennifer and she didn't look like this, but it's just for illustrative purposes. So she came to see me in the clinic with a very low mood. She had this crippling anxiety. She had muscle and joint pains and also palpitations, which were worse at night. She had reduced stamina, worsening migraines, recurrent urinary tract infections, and she'd stopped exercising because of the way she was feeling. She admitted that she'd put on a lot of weight over the last few years. She'd now put on 10 kilograms in weight and she did drink more than she used to around three or four units of alcohol each evening. She said that her sister and mother had had breast cancer in the past. In her medical history, reviewing everything in the past, in 2017, she was diagnosed with clinical depression. In 2018, she was diagnosed with osteoarthritis of both her hips and knees. And she was also diagnosed with raised cholesterol in that year. She was diagnosed with hypertension, raised blood pressure, which was a concern because her father and uncle have cardiovascular disease. And actually one of her uncles had died early due to a heart attack. 
She'd also had a DEXA scan a few years ago, which showed osteoporosis. And her mother and maternal grandmother have severe osteoporosis, especially in their spine. And she was very concerned about this. She'd been recently diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and she'd stopped working as an accountant in 2019. So I said to her, gosh, that's a lot that's happened and you really are quite young. So what happened? Is there anything that happened before that time? Or what, did you have any illnesses before 2017? And she said, no, not, nothing at all. And I said, did you have any operations? She said, oh, yes, I did. In 2016, I had both my ovaries removed because I had endometriosis and a couple of cysts. And they said it would be better off without my ovaries. So that was done in 2016. So obviously, what's her diagnosis? Well, of course, it's the menopause because I'm talking about the menopause. But she didn't know initially what was going on. So what did she do? She acquired some evidence based information. And over the past few years, I've worked with a team to really increase the amount of evidence based information that I produced. So we've got the app. We've got I've got three books. That's my third book. The cover there. We've got booklets. We've got leaflets. We've got a website with lots of information and also a weekly podcast that I, I produce as well. And she downloaded the app. She looked at her symptoms. She got more knowledge. And then, like a lot of women, she made her own diagnosis. Obviously, she was menopausal. But more specifically, she had a surgical menopause age 36. And no one had thought about giving her her hormones back. She had asked, actually, for HRT. And people said it was too dangerous because of her family history of breast cancer. So the real question is, should she be offered HRT and would it help her? Well, I'll come back to her at the end of my presentation. So really, just to think, what is the menopause? We talk about it a lot, a lot more people are talking about it. But do we really understand what it is? If we look it up, it's menopause, menstrual cycle stopping. So a lot of people define it as a year since the last menstrual cycle. Well, that can be difficult for women who don't have periods. For example, if someone's had a hysterectomy or use a marina coil or might just have really irregular periods anyway. And other people define it as the end of a woman's reproductive age. Well, I'm 53. I've had a hysterectomy. I've got three children. It would be a real miracle for me to become pregnant. I don't want to be defined as my periods or whether I'm fertile or not. So it's a bit more than that. It's also when our ovaries stop producing eggs. But in the case of Jennifer, she didn't have ovaries. So it's really when our ovaries don't work, either because they're not there or they've run out of eggs. Some people define it as a menopause transition, like a process we need to go through and something happens at the other side or a natural process. It is natural in the way for a lot of women, it's the same as aging, but there are lots of diseases that are occur as an association with aging that we don't ignore. So we need to really think about our hormones. Our ovaries produce really important hormones that go into our bloodstream, go around our body and affect every single cell in our, in our body. And without those hormones, there are, can be problems. So we need to think of it really as a long term hormone deficiency, which does affect all women at different ages. Of course, we're all different. But the main hormones are estradiol, testosterone and progesterone. And unless we do anything about it, once our ovaries don't work, they don't then start again. So this low hormones actually works until we die. And it is associated with symptoms, of course, which I'll discuss, but it's also associated with health risks. And when we think, is the menopause a disease? Is it an illness? Well, we need to compare it with other maybe illnesses, maybe diseases. Hypertension doesn't cause symptoms in most people, but we know if people have raised blood pressure, it increases their risk of heart disease, so therefore we treat it. Is obesity an illness or a disease? We can discuss that at another time, of course. But actually, we know that if people are obese, they have an increased risk of diabetes and also increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So we need to think about risks as well. We think about the history of the menopause. In the UK, the average age of the menopause is 51. No woman's average, of course. But in some countries, so for example, in India, the average age is about 40. It's quite a lot younger. And then around 3%, 3 in 100 women have POI, which is premature ovarian insufficiency, which actually means the menopause has occurred under the age of 40. My youngest patient was only 14 when she became menopausal because her ovaries didn't develop properly. Now, the life expectancy of women in the UK is 82 years. 
So it means that many of us will spend around a third of our lives postmenopausal. And then we've also got the perimenopause, which is the time when hormones start changing before our periods stop. And for some women, it can last for a decade. So women in their 40s will usually either be perimenopausal or menopausal if they've had an early menopause. So we need to really think about it is a female hormone deficiency syndrome with health risks. And when we talk about a deficiency, then we think about what are we doing about that deficiency. So if I told a patient or a person that they had iron deficiency anemia, the first question they usually ask is, how do I get the iron back in my body? So how do we diagnose the perimenopause and menopause? Well, there isn't an easy blood test or a saliva test or a urine test because our hormone levels change all the time. I could do a blood test in a woman in her 50s or 60s, and of course her hormone levels are going to be low. But that doesn't mean that all her symptoms are due to the menopause. And conversely, I might do a blood test in a young woman and find that her hormone levels are normal at the time of the blood test. But at three in the morning when she's waking up with dripping night sweats, of course, her hormone levels aren't going to be normal then. But I'm not going to go and do a blood test at three in the morning. So women can often make the diagnosis themselves when they have the right information. And we use a symptom questionnaire um, that can be downloaded from Balance. We use the same one in my clinic as well. And it's got the common symptoms that people have and we can rate them whether they're not at all mild, moderate or severe. And this is a really useful way of just trying to collect and think about whether the symptoms are there without any other reason for them. There are often many other symptoms as well that can be associated with the hormonal changes. We've gone a bit step further with the Balance app and people can actually download a health report from it. So if people are still having their periods, they can monitor periods and they can monitor their symptoms. So then it's very easy for people to go to their healthcare practitioner and say, look, these are my symptoms. This is my period pattern. And I would now like to talk to you about treatment options because I know that I'm either perimenopausal or menopausal. And it avoids the need for the clinician then to ask lots and lots of questions and waste time in the consultation. So what are the symptoms of the perimenopause and menopause? They can really vary between different people. Some people have very few symptoms at all, but most of us do experience symptoms and they can change with time. Some people start off having some night sweats and flushes and then those might disappear and then they feel more tired. They might have joint pains or they might have the anxiety, low mood, or they might have urinary symptoms. We don't always get all the symptoms together. Some people only have a few and some people have many more. Some people have symptoms that last for a few years. Some last for decades. We're all different and our experience of the menopause can be very different. There's a few women you might see, especially on social media, who will tell you that the menopause has been the most liberating, positive experience for them. That's great. But for many people, it's not positive experience. And they have symptoms affecting their ability to function and their well-being as well. And it's no surprise when you consider the role, especially of estradiol and testosterone, because when they get in the bloodstream, as I've said, they go all around the body. And I'm not going to read these slides out, but you can see they go into all our organs and they have really important roles in our organs. When we look at the symptoms of the menopause and we analyse on balance, where we've got lots and lots of women monitoring their symptoms, these are the top, top 20 symptoms. So brain fog, anxiety, low libido, memory problems, low mood, joint pains, being tired and low energy, difficult sleeping. They're the main symptoms. We've talked for decades about hot flushes, night sweats, and of course they feature in the top 20 symptoms, but they're not the commonest. And actually they're not the reason why people are giving up their jobs, giving up their partners, really finding life very difficult. And I've just listed a few unusual symptoms as well. Dry eyes can be very common. A dry mouth or a burning mouth can be very common as well. Some people have gum soreness. Tinnitus, this ringing in the ears, can be very relentless. And I've seen a lot of women who've been really haunted with this symptom. They've seen ENT, ear, nose and throat specialists. Everything's been normal, but it's carried on. They've had joint swelling, dizziness. Shortness of breath can occur because we've got estrogen and testosterone receptors in our lungs and also irritable bowel symptoms can be very common and heartburn as well. Restless leg syndrome um, is very common, but the symptoms that affect people the most actually and the ones that we see in the clinic 
the symptoms that affect people the most are the psychological symptoms, the low mood, the anxiety, the intrusive thoughts, the ruminating, the, the overwhelming often anxiety that can occur. I've had people that tell me they vomit even thinking about packing to go on a holiday, which they would have normally enjoyed. People are avoiding going out, they're avoiding using public transport feeling very low, have reduced self-esteem, loss of self-confidence. A lot of people tell me they just feel like they're existing rather than living. And this is because our hormones can be so important in our brains. And we know that the menopause can be associated with other behaviours, especially addictive behaviours. So alcohol addiction, drug addiction, gaming, gambling, they can increase in the menopause and perimenopause because our brains are trying to get this dopamine hit that they're not getting from our own hormones. And ADHD can increase or worsen. And domestic abuse, very sadly, has shown to increase during the menopause. And that can be um, both physical and verbal. Eating disorders can also increase in the menopause, but also we need to remember that eating disorders can lead to period stopping because our body's function is to be healthy when we're pregnant. So if our body weight becomes too low, our periods stop. If our periods stop at whatever age, it means we haven't got the hormones associated with it. So people with an eating disorder can actually have an earlier menopause as well. We need to think about the power of our hormones in our brains. And this slide just shows you like how our brain gets lit up with estrogen and testosterone. So the red is testosterone, the yellow is estrogen and cells that respond to these hormones. And these areas of our brain are really important in the way we think, in the way that we remember, in the way that we um, stimulate tasks in the way that we even coordinate. Our cerebellum is really important for our coordination. Also for our, our emotions as well, really important. And you can see that if you're stripped of those hormones, the levels are low, your brain won't light up in the same way. These hormones are neurotransmitters. They change the way that pathways in the, in the, in the brain work, they reduce inflammation in the brain. Very important, and we've known this for decades, but it seems to have been ignored as people are just talking about the flushes and sweats. And this is quite a complicated slide, but our immune cells are our cells that fight infection. And we have estrogen receptors on these cells and they can be genetically reprogrammed. They can change the way they work. They can change the type of chemicals that are produced from these cells when they're stimulated by estrogen. And this is really important because if we have low estrogen, these immune cells don't work in the same way. They become pro-inflammatory and they work against us. And it's not just affecting us when we have an infection it affects us to protect from diseases as well. And the endothelium is the lining of our blood vessels and oestrogen is very anti-inflammatory on the lining of our blood vessels. It can affect um, atheroma, the buildup of plaques. So with oestrogen, we keep our blood vessels open better. The blood vessels are more, um, they're more spongy, they're more springy, they react more to um, opening and closing. And some of the cytokines that can occur um, actually are really beneficial as well. So these are chemicals like nitric oxide, endothelin, really good for helping keeping our blood vessels open. So we have maximum blood going through, so maximum oxygen and good nutrients going to all our organs in our body. Very important. And we know from studies that the longer a woman is in without their hormones, the higher the risk of heart disease, but also of heart failure and atrial fibrillation. And this study that came out in 2022 shows that the younger the women are, so the women under the age of 40 when they're diagnosed with the menopause, have a lot higher risk of heart failure and atrial fibrillation. I've already mentioned the role in our brains, and this is just from a paper that came out a few years ago now, and it shows how um, our mitochondria, which is our powerhouse of our cells, can be affected. And this oxidative process can really change when people have low hormones. And it's also thought in the perimenopause, we've got these swings of estrogen go up and down, causing a lot of chaos in our brains, which can really affect the way that our brain functions at a very cellular level really work or don't work as well. 
And then we know in our muscles and, and, and bones, really important, again, quite a busy picture, but it shows how oestrogen can stimulate various pathways and cells in both our, our muscles on the right and our bones on the left. And that's very important when we think about keeping our bodies fit and healthy as well. This is quite a busy slide that I've put together, but in the middle is inflammation. And if we have inflammation, we have an increased risk of inflammatory conditions. So heart disease, osteoporosis, diabetes, dementia. But you'll look here, it even says inflammatory bowel disease, Parkinson's disease, it has lung diseases, it has um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, rheumatoid arthritis is there. And obviously cancers are very inflammatory conditions as well. But in the middle of all this, actually, is estradiol. Estrogen, the body identical estrogen that we produce when we're younger, reduces inflammation. So we know younger women who produce hormones have a lot lower risk of these diseases than women who are menopausal without their hormones. And for me as a physician and a pathologist, this slide is really transformational for the way that I think about the menopause being a hormone deficiency. And I hope you can understand that too. They're just listing the risks to our health with the menopause. So with our low hormones, we have an increased risk of inflammatory diseases, which I've listed here as well. Really important. And studies have known and shown this for many years, especially women who have an early menopause under the age of 40, really do have an increased risk of these diseases. And this is why it's so important that we think and reflect about ourselves being perimenopausal and menopausal. What are we going to do? How are we going to reduce our risk of these diseases? Are we going to take hormones or not? Are we going to exercise or not? Are we changing our diet or not? Are we going to think about smoking, alcohol? All these things need to be taken into consideration. It's not just one lifestyle change and ignoring everything else. And I feel very strongly that menopause care is an opportunity. For me as a menopause specialist, it's the most transformational medicine that I've ever done in my life. And if I intervene properly at this point in, in life, ideally earlier in the perimenopause, then I can actually really help women to feel better. But more importantly, I can prevent disease in these, these women. We have very clear guidelines, both national and international guidelines about managing the menopause in women of all ages, including women who are young as well. And just to summarise these guidelines, they're very clear about individualised care. Everything we do in medicine should be individualised. Women should be given information in a way they understand of the benefits and any potential risks of HRT so they can make appropriate treatment choices. And for the majority of women, the benefits of taking HRT do outweigh any risks. They also very clear there's no maximum length of time for taking HRT. So women can usually take it for as long as the benefits outweigh any risks, which is usually forever. And of course, our lifestyle is really important as well. So there are different types of HRT, and I'm going to focus on body identical HRT, which basically means these hormones look exactly the same as the hormones that we produce when we're younger. So they haven't been chemically modified in any way. If you Google menopause tre treatments, there's a plethora of treatments available now, all sorts of treatments, even shampoos and face creams that offer all these amazing, um, um, they've got lots of claims, how good they are, but there's no evidence behind them. A lot of it is a marketing plan. So just be very, very careful if you're sucked into to thinking or buying any of these. So HRT is not a one size fits all. There are different doses, there are different types, there are different preparations, there are different hormones. And so we usually give the oestrogen through the skin as a patch general spray. And then there's a natural progesterone in the UK, it's called Utergestan, and then testosterone as well. We think of the benefits because for the last 20 years or so, everyone's talked about the risks of HRT, but there are benefits as well. And certainly when it was first discovered, over about 100 years ago, people so quickly realised that there were benefits for women taking HRT. And of course, if you get the dose and type right, it improves symptoms. We know for the majority of women, the benefits of taking HRT outweigh any risks that I've already said. But actually, it makes sense as well, telling you what I've told you already, that if we take HRT, then the women that take it have a lower risk of inflammatory diseases. 
the evidence isn't really clear cut for some diseases like dementia because often in dementia studies they've grouped together all types of HRT and older types do have some small risks whereas the body identical don't but we know that these diseases can reduce for some women who take body identical hormones. Yet, why aren't more, more women taking HRT? You'd think most people would. Well, actually, in the UK, only around 14% of menopausal women take HRT. Globally, it's around 6%, very low. I can't think of any other area in medicine when we have evidence-based treatment available showing from our guidelines that they improve health for the majority of the, that population, but yet only the minority um, actually are receiving it. And in areas of deprivation in the UK, it can be as low as 2%. Absolutely scandalous for, for women who are suffering. So there are lots of benefits, there's symptom reduction, there's quality of life improvement, cardiovascular benefit, bone benefit, actually reducing death as well from all causes, including from cancer. We've developed an easy HRT prescribing guide and the most important thing is thinking about the type of hormones that are prescribed. So transdermal oestrogen through the skin is given as a patch dental spray and that way it goes straight in through the skin into the bloodstream and the dose can be varied. Our absorption really varies as well so some people need a higher dose to get the same response as others who need a lower dose. There's no risk of clot because with um, the oestrogen going through the skin it, it just goes into the bloodstream around the body it doesn't have to be metabolized by the liver and it doesn't affect our sex hormone binding globulin. The oral contraceptive pill can affect our sex hormone binding globulin which can affect our freely available testosterone. So the guidelines say we should consider Consider transdermal oestrogen for women who are obese, who have diabetes, migraine, gallbladder or liver problems. But generally in my practice, it's first line treatment because there are overwhelming benefits for it and it's cheap as well. Then we usually give the natural progesterone. So it's micronized progesterone or body identical. And there are other types of progestogens that are in, for example, the contraceptive pills, which we can offer or give. And they all have slightly different uh, properties. Some act a bit more testosterone like some that have this these spironolactone derivatives which can affect um, our kidneys as well and there can be benefits but for most people we start off giving the micronized progesterone and it's micronized which means it goes to a very small particle size and it's it's suspended in an oily excipient so then it's easier to become absorbed and then metabolized in the body it's usually taken orally and it's derived from the wild yam plants. So it's the exact duplicate of the progesterone we produce when we're younger um, and it's metabolically and biologically very different to the synthetic progestogens. So a lot of people say, well, I didn't didn't really um, like taking the contraceptive pill when I was younger or the implant didn't suit me. Well, actually, this is very different. We can um, often find that people um, who use the progesterone either orally or vaginally or even rectally find that they have a very beneficial effect with it. So this is a paper I wrote several years ago now talking about the effectiveness of transdermal oestrogen and natural micronized progesterone for menopausal symptoms. Then the other hormone that I haven't mentioned is testosterone. And we know many years ago, even in the 19, 1940, they did a first cl testosterone clinical trial and they looked at the metabolic effects of testosterone in men and women. How wonderful that they were doing studies in women then. But since that time, it's been neglected. And we've always thought about it as a male hormone, but actually testosterone is the most biologically active hormone in women. And many of you might not realize, but as women, when we're younger, we produce three times more testosterone than estrogen. And we have cells that respond to testosterone, so they have testosterone receptors on them all over our body. And I've listed a few places, but they're everywhere. So it has a really important biological function and our, our levels just gradually decline as we get older. A lot of our testosterone is produced from our ovaries. So if women have their ovaries removed, their levels of testosterone plummet. There are many symptoms of testosterone deficiency, which I've listed here, but everyone just talks about reduced libido, but it's all these other symptoms that are really important. 
testosterone use in women is actually very limited and in the UK we're allowed to consider it for women who are already on HRT who have reduced sexual desire and if we think of hypersexual desire dysfunction HSDD it's defined as loss or absence of sexual desire associated with personal distress but it's actually very common around a third of women between 40 and 64 years and around 13 percent of women who are a little bit older so these women are being denied a treatment um, and there's a lot of them and i'm not quite sure why we don't have any mhri licensed specific testosterone product in the uk um, many countries don't have a female specific testosterone product that's licensed for them we're allowed to prescribe it off label. So obviously men have, a, men have a licensed testosterone, of course they do. We can prescribe that in lower doses. Some places um, and countries use compounded bioidentical testosterone products, but these are neither licensed nor regulated. I certainly don't prescribe those, but in some countries, that's the only way they can get hold of testosterone. We tend to use um, the Australian manufactured um, testosterone, which is licensed in Australia called Androfen. So that's another option as well. But if we look at the menopause uh, guidelines, which now came out in 2015, many years ago now, it does say we can consider testosterone for women with reduced sexual desire. And these are some guidelines that are written by the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual um, Health in, in America. And they do quote to say that the limitation is that testosterone therapy is not approved by regulatory or, uh, agencies. So prescribing is very challenging and there is substantial evidence regarding the safety, efficacy and clinical use. Access to testosterone therapy is a significant unmet need for about a third of women who are menopausal. This paper came out recently showing that there was an association with cardiovascular disease. So women who have low levels of testosterone have a greater risk of cardiovascular disease. No one's done the next part, which should be done looking at do women who take testosterone have a lower risk of cardiovascular disease? So if we look at testosterone, low testosterone we know is important in our brains in the hippocampus. It's also likely to protect, as I've said before, with estradiol, but testosterone can have this effect on oxidative stress, apoptosis, which is programmed cell death, and also amyloid. And amyloid deposition is very important when we think about dementia and also tau protein. And estradiol and testosterone can reduce amyloid deposition and reduce tau protein as well. And we know, like estradiol, testosterone is very favourable effects on the endothelium, the lining of the blood vessels as well. And even some studies have shown it may be protective for breast cancer as well. This is a, a study by someone called Rebecca, or a paper by someone called Rebecca Glazier, who looks at myths and misconceptions about testosterone. And there is another presentation that I've done in this series for the course about testosterone specifically. So if you want more information, you might want to listen to that. I also want to talk not just about the menopause symptoms and health risks, but vaginal dryness and discomfort. Around a half of women who are menopausal experience discomfort during sex. And this was according to a study we did a couple of, a few years ago now, um, but it was very revealing. Also, over a third of women felt anxious about having sex due to concerns about the discomfort. And 65% of women avoided having sex because it was so uncomfortable, yet they weren't talking to their partners even or their friends about how uncomfortable it was. So there's a something called genitourinary syndrome of the menopause. It used to be called vul vulvovaginal atrophy. But if you look up the word atrophy, it means wasting or withering away. I don't want to think that I'm wasting or withering away as a menopausal woman. So they changed the term. And actually, that includes the urinary symptoms as well. Because we have estrogen receptors in our uh, vulva in our vagina around our clitoris but also in our urinary tract as well in our bladder in our pelvic floor in our urethra a lot of women when they have low hormones in that area or those areas they have ex experienced symptoms encompassing the urinary tract as well as the vulva and the vagina as well and we know so this includes the vulvo vaginal symptoms and the lower urinary tract symptoms we know from studies that these symptoms affect the majority of women, yet only the minority of women receive treatment. So there are many, many women 
globally who are needlessly suffering. And this is one of the few symptoms of the menopause that does progress with time. Sweats and flushes might come and go, but actually these symptoms, once they start, they usually continue and persist. We know a lot of women aren't seeking medical advice, but sadly, we know that women have had symptoms for around three years before they've received any help. And many women and also healthcare professionals consider symptoms of GSM just to be a natural and unavoidable part of aging. We know that there's so much advertising about pads for people who have leakage of urine, um, of urine when you cough, sneeze, oh dear, never mind, just pop a pad in. Well, actually, it's not normal to be coughing and sneezing and leaking urine or have urge incontinence where you have to richly run to the toilet as soon as you're thinking about it. We should have better controls of our bladder and also urinary um, tract infections are very very common if we can address and prevent urinary tract infections it will prevent a lot of inappropriate antibiotic prescribing and also urosepsis so sepsis due to urinary tract infections very common in older women so we know it's due to low estrogen and testosterone actually in the vagina and surrounding tissues and the symptoms can really vary We've written a consensus statement for the management of GSM with the British Society of Sexual Medicine, which is available on our website. And we also have a lot of resources as well that people can access. So we have um, lots of treatments. HRT can improve these symptoms, but around 20% of women taking HRT need to use local estrogen treatments or hormonal treatments. And some people just choose not to take HRT, but still need to use the local hormones. So they can be a pessary, there's a little uh, silicon ring that can be very useful. Or there's um, gel or cream. And sometimes people need a combination of these products to really help. There's also something called prasterone, which contains DHEA, which converts to estrogen and testosterone. And it's a daily pessary, which I use a lot in my clinical practice with really good effect. There's an oral treatment called osphenophene, which is a CERM, which means it's selective estrogen receptor modulator, which can be beneficial, but actually it doesn't address the um the, it doesn't address the symptoms in exactly the same way and it can cause side effects. So we don't really use that as first line treatment. So why are we being refused our own hormones? This is what I don't really understand. And this is what lots of people don't understand as well. So why are women being refused HRT? Well, there's all sorts of reasons, of course, but actually the evidence is being misinterpreted often. So people are being more scared and it's easy just to say no in medicine without really thinking of the consequences for these women. There's a concern for many doctors and healthcare professionals that they, they do the wrong thing. If they prescribe HRT and there's a problem, then they might be sued. Now, women can have problems whether they take HRT or not. They can have diseases if they take HRT or not. But actually, if someone develops the disease taking HRT, it doesn't mean the HRT has caused it. Guidelines are often not up to date with evidence, and that's really, really difficult. The NICE guidance are now several years old, and also the regulatory authorities don't update the evidence either. And then there's patient fear. People are really scared, and there's inadequate training for clinicians also. So that compounds everything as well, that there's people that just want to help patients, but they don't understand. And the biggest reason people are scared is about the breast cancer risk. They're worried about breast cancer and HRT risk. And so what it all stems from is this WHI study, the Women's Health Initiative study, which came out over 20 years ago. And this was a randomized control study to look compared to East, um, with you put women either taking estrogen, only HRT, estrogen with a synthetic progesterone, or a placebo. And this was a statement that said they confirm that it increases the risk of breast cancer. When this statement came out, of course, the world stopped taking HRT, doctors and clinicians stopped prescribing HRT, understandably. But we need to think a bit more about and summarize the study. So it was using conjugated equine estrogens, oral estrogens derived from pregnant horses' urine, and medoxyprogesterone acetone, a synthetic progesterone. And what they did was they gave this um, HRT to women who didn't have symptoms. These are women who were on average age was in their 60s. 
a lot of them were overweight, a lot of them were obese, a lot of them had had cardiovascular disease, very different population to those younger women who are usually quite fit and well, who have got symptoms, who would give HRT4. But what they found, this increased risk of breast cancer with combination HRT, there was an absolute risk of eight cases per 10,000 women per year. But when they analysed the data properly, which they hadn't when the press release came out, it was not statistically significant. And also, these results have been wrongly extrapolated to all women with all types of HRT, which it wasn't. Actually, even in this study, when they looked at those women who'd had a hysterectomy and only had oestrogen, there was actually no increased risk of breast cancer. And even more than that, there was actually a lower risk of breast cancer in those women. Really important that we remember that. But also, you can't compare the synthetic um, hormones that were given in those studies compared to the natural body identical hormones that we give now. It's like prescribed uh, comparing apples with pears. Of course, they're all fruit, but they're very different. And the same with this type of HRT. So when we do the when we when they've done the 20 year follow up data and had a really good look, this risk of breast cancer was small, but again, not statistically significant. And with oestrogen alone, there was a lower risk of breast cancer and also a lower risk of dying from breast cancer. Really important. And then this is a Finnish nationwide study which showed breast cancer mortality according to age. And it, you can see all of them are below the, the standard mortality ratio of one, which means that it was beneficial on mortality in women who took either type of HRT. The only one that came over the line actually was women in their 80s. And again, that wasn't statistically significant. Then when we look at different types of progesterone, they've not done randomised control studies, but this is a good study, the E3N cohort study, comparing different types of uh, progesterone. And you'll see in pink, oestrogen with micronized progesterone, again, the relative risk, the adjusted relative risk is one. So it doesn't cross the line. So there wasn't an increased risk of breast cancer in their analysis, which there is with other types of HRT. Again, just another signal to show that our own hormones are probably very beneficial, which does really make sense because if our hormones were so bad for us, younger people would be far more at risk of diseases than older people. Also, we need to remember when the WHI study came out, around one in 12 women were uh, being diagnosed with breast cancer. HRT prescribing has more than halved, yet breast cancer incidence has increased from one in 12 women to around one in seven women. If it was just related to hormones, then surely the incidence of breast cancer would reduce associated with HRT prescribing. We also obviously need to think about other risk factors for breast cancer. And a lot of women have breast cancer because of bad luck, of course. Sometimes it can run in families, but also smoking, alcohol, not exercising, being overweight, modifiable risk factors are very, very common. A lot of menopausal women are saying, I don't want HRT, but they've changed their lifestyle. They're drinking more to numb their symptoms. They're not exercising because they feel so tired or they've got muscle and joint pains. They're putting on weight because of the metabolic changes that occur in the menopause or they're smoking. And so we need to think about other risk factors for breast cancer as well. I wanted to mention antidepressants in the menopause because a lot of women we see in the clinic are actually prescribed antidepressants and they know they're not depressed, but that's what's been offered for them. Now, mental health, as I've said, is really common mental health problems in the perimenopause and menopause. To think about reproductive depression. So we've got PMDD. Um, postnatal depression, perimenopausal depression. These figures, I think, are too low. Um, I think it affects a lot more people, but it shows that some women are very sensitive to hormonal changes. And if we think about antidepressants in the menopause or perimenopause, they actually don't show, there's no evidence that they improve the low mood associated with the perimenopause and menopause. Mm -hmm. And a lot of women say to me, I just feel numb. And we know that SSNRIs and SSRIs shouldn't be offered as first line treatment for the low mood associated with the menopause. Obviously, they can be used in conjunction with HRT. If a woman is clinically depressed, she might need antidepressants. But if she's also perimenopausal and menopausal, she shouldn't be denied HRT also. Just wanted to mention clot risk. A lot of women are told, um, come to see us and they're told that they can't have HRT because of the risk of clots. Well, actually, the risk of clot with HRT depends on the type of HRT. 
we need to know that all release students, so tablet estrogen, there is a small increased risk because it gets metabolized into the um, through through the liver and our liver produces clotting factors. And the highest risk is the first year of taking HRT. It's only a small increased risk, but as we get older, our background risk of clot increases. Transdermal through the skin, estrogen is not associated with a risk of clot. And actually the studies show it's probably associated with a slightly lower risk of clot compared to not taking anything. And vaginal estrogens and hormones don't get absorbed systemically, so there isn't a risk of clot with those. The synthetic progestogens we know do have a very small increased risk of around 50% in women who have are taking combined HRT with the synthetic progestogens, but actually there's no increased risk with a micronized progesterone. So another big tick for, for body identical hormones. About raised blood pressure and HRT, well, HRT um, can actually be beneficial for blood pressure as well. We know that estrogen through the skin can act as a vasodilator, so it can dilate the blood vessels and lower blood pressure. And micronized progesterone is very neutral on blood pressure, unlike synthetic progesterones, which can increase it. And HRT can also lower cholesterol. We see a lot of women whose cholesterol is sneaking up in the perimenopause and menopause. We give them HRT and the cholesterol lowers. And that's really important to think about because menopause really is a cardiometabolic problem. So if women's got raised blood pressure, it's not a contraindication to taking HRT. Some people might need blood pressure lowering treatment as well as HRT, absolutely fine, but they shouldn't be denied body identical hormones. And we should ideally, just as part of health screening, do an annual blood pressure check. HRT, when you look at the evidence, there's more evidence that it's more effective than statins or antihypertensives for the primary prevention of coronary heart disease. And we know from Cochrane data, a big study showing that there is a 70% relative risk of um, reduction of all cause mortality and a 52% relative risk reduction of heart disease mortality. And the most benefit is started is when HRT started early. So if we go back to the patient Jennifer, who I spoke about right at the beginning. She was given estrogen patches. She had an early surgical menopause. We know there's overwhelming evidence that for her future health and her symptoms, HRT is beneficial. She didn't need progesterone um, as well because she'd actually had a hysterectomy with her ovaries being removed. So she was given a good dose of estrogen. A lot of studies have shown that younger women need higher doses. So she was started on a on a the, the standard dose, and then it was increased because her estradiol level was low and she was still experiencing symptoms so her absorption of the estrogen was not great but she liked the convenience of the patches so we increased the amount she was using absolutely fine to do her repeat estradiol level on 200 micrograms was physiological 620 picomoles per liter but when she was reviewed she was still complaining of reduced libido low stamina brain fog poor sleep and so she was decided and the decision was made between her and her clinician to start testosterone when she was reviewed, she was feeling more like her previous self. She applied for another job, which she was successful in. And these are just some quotes I thought I'd share with you. But she said, I've regained my energy levels, joined a gym. I can go through the day without feeling like I'm going to fall over with exhaustion. I never thought I would say this, but truly, you have given me back my life. And we hear words like this all the time in the clinic, which is wonderful. But it's also incredibly sad that there are so many women struggling who aren't able to receive this treatment. So not only have the hormones helped her symptoms, they've invested in her future health, but they've also allowed her to start thinking about her diet, exercise and everything else as well. So just to summarise, the take home messages of this presentation is that all women really deserve individualised care for their menopause and their perimenopause. And menopause, as I'm sure you know, and lead to many different symptoms. And also, this is really important, that there are health risks of the low hormones and HRT does provide many benefits. Testosterone can be beneficial. And like I say, there's more information in my other presentation about testosterone. And antidepressants should not be given first line for low mood. Long term vaginal estrogen is safe for most women. And usually when we start prescribing it, we continue it forever as well. And non-hormonal lubricants and moisturisers can be used in addition with local hormones. If people still are experiencing symptoms. Evidence based information is essential for all of us as clinicians, but also as patients, too. 
This just is a, a slide I wanted to show because I'm very proud that the balance, the free balance app has been helped by more, it, it's helped more than a million women globally. And we have a huge number of views each week and a huge number of health reports that have been downloaded and used for, pay, for, for, for women in their own consultations. This is a picture of um, some women that we've been doing some outreach work in. So women who've experienced FGM and some of their friends and family who came to talk and understand more about what it means. And I've already said about how GSM symptoms were so, are so common. I can't imagine for these women, a lot of them are very scared, knowing that their bodies were changing, their symptoms were occurring. They thought it was due to them having been cut when they're younger, but actually knowing it was related to their hormones, really powerful messaging that was going on in this day. And finally, uh, a lot of people, once they're empowered with information, then they can receive the help that they want. And a lot of my work is about patient choice. But I hope this presentation has helped actually allay some fears, given you some groundwork to think more about the evidence that we have to support the safe use of HRT and to manage people appropriately in the menopause. So thank you for listening.